And the idea about separation of powers is that because the executive wields the everyday powers and, and, and authority of government, you should have the two institutions that should place a check on those powers. Mm. So once you make a, the president part of parliament, he addresses parliament, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and when the president does address parliament, by the way, he, 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 he sits there as you know head of parliament mm. for that period. Mm -hmm. So it's often difficult now to hold this president, who's head of the executive branch of government, to account because somehow you know. He addresses parliament, he's part of somehow the architecture of parliament, and parliament does debates the speech of uh, the president, etc., etc. That does not um, augur well for separation of powers. Yes, subscribe. You always they watch we program them, but you not subscribe it to the channel. All what you get for do, press this red subscribe button. And then you come over here to and press this bell. To the bell option, press this one with all. And don't don't. And no get for cost you anything. When you do this, na sign for show say you the support we for make we do more. Thank you for all your help me for share this program. Yeah, God bless you. in the name of Sierra Leone, E, the exercise of prerogative of mercy, F, the grant of honors and awards, G, the declaration of war, and H, such other matters as may be referred by the president by parliament. The Constitutional Review Committee has made a number of recommendations for constitutional change. These recommendations include the exclusion of the president from parliament to provide for more effective separation of powers and that the president should be titled the chief executive rather than the supreme executive authority and powers of appointments should be limited to the appointment of ambassadors, envoys, judges of the superior court of judicature, ministers of government, public officials subject to the provisions of the constitution and parliamentary approval. Well now, to my guest. Today I'm joined in the studio by Augustine Marat, legal practitioner and activist. Welcome to Law Review. Thank you, Nikki. I'm very excited. I think we were part of the maiden edition of the show, so yes, I'm you to were. Be back. <laughs> I'm happy yes, to be you back. were. And this is episode eight. Oh yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you, we've come a while, and uh, you're coming back to a very. Um, Juicy subject oh, yes. uh, for Sierra Leone. So thank you for being here today and let's go straight into it. You heard in my little um, preamble uh, talking about the, you know, the powers uh, granted to the, the president. And under our uh, 1991 constitution, the president retains executive powers which can be ex exercised by him or through his vice president who is the principal assistant to the president, ministers, deputy ministers, and other public officers. Okay. Inasmuch as our constitution, that's the 1991 constitution, and, and uh, viewers of Law Review would have um, heard us talk, talk about the 1991 constitution. So if you, didn't, if you don't know what constitution governs us right now, yeah. it's the 1991 constitution. So um, given that the Constitution makes provisions for checks and balances uh, through this doctrine of separation of powers, and that it makes it clear that all powers and functions of the president are to be exercised subject to judicial oversight, um, many of these powers also require parliamentary approval uh, to take effect. Still, many of the view that these checks and balances, even though provided provided for through the Constitution are not effective. Either they're not effective or um, they're not enough. Um, so first, are you of that opinion? If you are, if you're not, could you um, give some examples of, of some instances in your opinion that would qualify? I think the question is multi-loaded. It uh, is. <laughs> I mean, let me just say firstly that um, the 1991 constitution, back then in 1991, was such a progressive constitution. 
um, you know, the number of safeguards that are inserted in that document. Mm -hmm. For the 1991 era, it was pretty ambitious. I mean, it was almost the end of the Cold War. Um, there was this sharp divide bet between the Eastern Blocs and mm -hmm. the Western Blocs. And, and, and so that, that explains um, substantially why we could not have the socioeconomic rights in the Constitution, because back then, I mean, the Eastern Bloc, they were pretty much opposed to socioeconomic rights. Mm. Um, I, I think much as the Constitution then was pretty progressive, I think that the doctrine of separation of powers is not fully, fully achieved. And I say this for a number of reasons. Um, so what we did, Celio, as a nation, was that we adopted an American sort of um, style government mm. um, in that we, we had a you know, president, executive president with so, so, so much powers. Mm. And so what the Constitution contemplated um, was that those powers would be curtailed by the other levers of government, mm. i.e. legislature and then judiciary. Mm. But here's the thing. So firstly, um, in the, also in the Constitution, it says that the president is also a member of parliament, mm -hmm. part of parliament. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, that's, that, that was a fundamental blunder. We'll come to that one. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So, um, because you, uh, it's difficult to be part of an architecture and then you're also accountable to that um, institution. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, when it comes to um, the judiciary, you know, just the issue of appointment of, I mean, if you say that the, the judiciary should inquire into acts, um, policies of government, etc., etc., and those folks who inquire and determine the legitimacy otherwise of those actions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are also appointed by the president. So what I would say is that as far as the books are concerned, we have three separate branches of government, but practically speaking, it's very di difficult to say that we, 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 we achieve, I mean, um, beyond the print, mm. separation of powers. Because mm. we see more and more that, you know, that the president is involved somehow in parliament, the president is involved somehow in the judiciary, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it was ambitious. Um, in terms of making sure that we have this semblance of separation of powers, but um, in reality we don't. Well, let's come to, to um, this issue about, about the, the president being a part of parliament, recognized by the constitution. The implications of this may not be clear. I mean, for the most part, all what, what we see in practice is that the president attends parliament, you know, to make the state of the nation address, right? Um, so what's wrong with that? I, I think fundamentally, I mean, the problem that that poses is, is, is the fact that if you want three separate branches of government, my, by the way, the speaker does not convene a cabinet meeting and address them. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. Um, so once you do that, you elevate the executive lever of government above parliament. And the idea about separation of powers is that because the executive wields the everyday powers and, and, and authority of government, you should have the two institutions that should place a check on those powers. Mm. So once you make a, the president part of parliament, he addresses parliament, a sector, a sector. Uh, and when the president does address parliament, by the way, he, 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 he sits there as you know, head of parliament mm. for that period. Mm -hmm. So it's often difficult now to all this president who's head of the executive branch of government to account because somehow you know he addresses parliament is part of somehow the architecture of parliament and parliament does debates the speech of uh, the president etc cetera, etc cetera. that does not um, augur well for separation of powers uh, for me uh, and, and i'm going to use the she because yeah. you know let's just make oh, this, yeah, sorry, sorry. let's just be, make this as you know generic as, as, uh, yeah. as it should be. Um, if the president, if she makes a, a, a statement to parliament, if she sits in parliament, is that really the issue? I mean, if she makes a, spe if she makes a speech in parliament, is that the issue? 
uh, shouldn't we be more specific about what aspects of, of these checks and balances we're talking about? Are we talking about the fact that w when she sits in Parliament, she should, be, she should sit as a guest? She should be uh, invited to Parliament. She, sh she should not have powers to convene Parliament. Cut, yeah, th is the, are these the issue, things that you're talking about? Cut. Because to me, you know, when you say uh, she makes a speech to Parliament or she addresses the nation from... So? But she, it, it, I mean, she does have yeah. um, powers to summon Parliament. Yes. Yes. So, uh, but that's what I'm saying. So, yes. should she, uh, if we, if the, if people are proposing um, changes uh, in terms of this, um, wanting to strengthen separation of powers, is the proposal that those sorts of powers should be what is expunged? I, I mean, I, I just want you to be clear about you know what aspects you're talking about. Um, you, you know, so so so. When we come back to the powers to summon, yeah. I mean, you and I know what um, summons are. Mm -hmm. uh, it's almost like a legal, you know, um, order or directive that Parliament must must convene. Um, so once you arrogate such power to the presidency, it kind of creates the impression and beyond creation of impression, it kind of gives the feeling that the president um, is, is, is above parliament or the president is in charge of parliament. Right. So once you remove the power of um, in the president to summon parliament, you leave that power to speak of parliament, um, then effectively the speech delivery in parliament would only be ceremonial now. Mm, mm. Would only be ceremonial. Mm. But once he wields the power to summon parliament, then um, 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 somehow it interferes substantially with the doctrine of separation of powers because the doctrine says that every branch should be separate and that you, you should have heads of each branch that should call the shots in um, those branches. You made mention of um, appointments. Uh, uh, you, you started saying something about you know, uh, the judiciary. You made mention of um, the fact that um, how um, a branch that has to make decisions and look into um, perhaps you know laws, acts, actions of one branch. How independent would they be if they're the, if they're being appointed by um, one of the branches? What would you suggest in the alternate? I, I think they've, they've got like a different uh, model, but you know, across um, for example in Kenya, mm. what they do is that they invite applications from. Um, suitably qualified persons would apply, they're shortlisted, um, you know, um, they're called to, I think they, they conduct interviews on national broadcasters, mm. for example. They um, undergo the interview process. Um, at the end of the day, the judicial, the equivalent of judicial legal service, service commission that we have here mm. would compile the, the names of people who are um, qualified to uh, accept it mm. at the end of the process mm. and then they would submit those names to the press to the president mm. and the president performs a ceremonial duty of appointment so actually the appointment is done by this body mm. separates not answerable to the president they forward the names and then those persons who are um, um, selected mm -hmm. at, at the end of the process they will be appointed ceremonially so what the president does is just to append his signature ceremonially to the process, but the entire process is done outside the limits of the presidency. In, in, in another jurisdiction, in South Africa, for example, what they do is, for example, in, in the case of the chief justice, the commission would recommend, let's say, a number of names, um, A, B, C. Mm. The president would have to select um, from those three persons who were submitted by the commission. I mean, if he thinks that all oh, those three persons are not in his estimation qualified, black, you know, et cetera, et cetera, he would have to give reasons for rejecting those persons. Mm -hmm. hmm? mm -hmm. And those valid reasons mm -hmm. to the commission, yeah, and the yeah. commission can, uh, can equally ask forward, questions on, yes, on the, forward, the reasons. Um, separate, separate names. So in effect, what that does is that it protects those institutions um, and and it, it, it ensures that these judges are not forever at the mercy of the presidency. Because mm. once you appoint someone, you almost um, always would have the rope around your neck mm. and what, control them. What about electing judges? Um, I, I think that's 
I don't know where I don't I don't know the jurisdiction of it, but I know that um, in certain jurisdictions they. The same way we appoint our parliamentarians, right. they appoint judges. judges. So, they are, so for example, the number of names would um, would be vetted and and put forward on mm. the ballot boxes, mm -hmm. and then um, people would come forward to say, you know, of these um, ten persons, we want to appoint two or three, mm. and then they would tick them in that order. At the end of the day, the folks who poll the, the highest, highest votes, votes would be. Appoint. But of course, when it comes to um, judicial functions right. people are very very um circumspect not to um you know bring in popular pop, I mean, popularity you know so that's why the other school um, school of thought says if you have a commission that is drawn from all walks of life mm. those persons who have integrity can then appoint judges mm -hmm. and then forward those names. Because mm -hmm. once you open it, it will be a matter of campaign. Yeah, and if I, if I pull votes from, um, I as votes from McKinney or Bo, for example, right. and they send me as resident judge, I will know these, these are my folks. Right. They voted for me. Right. So it, it comes yes. back to, yeah. you know. But it's just uh, different models that, uh, you know, yeah. uh, come through. We've got ours. Um, here and, and in, in Sierra Leone, and, and then the, the case is, is, has been made um, through our CRC process that, um, you know, the, the, the process w that's enshrined as it is in our constitution uh, could do with some adjustments. Uh, perhaps justifiably so, based on, you know, recent events, not so recent events. But this is an ongoing uh, conversation. Uh, let's talk uh, uh, some more about you know the powers of of the president. Um, the president also has powers to do things like appointing the auditor general and the ACC uh, commissioner. You have one school of thought that you know puts forward the idea that this somehow uh, it, it tarnishes or, or uh, undermines transparency and cre credibility and there's a, there's another side equally that says it does not because the pool uh, to which they they uh, the appointments are made always it's circumspect it goes through certain checks and and these people whoever they are appointed also uh, ostensibly uh, their own um, legislation that govern them state quite clearly that they are to operate independently so um, what, what 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 would you say to that I mean the the, the there's the popular phrase, he who, who pays the piper calls the tune, tune, but, you know, would that apply here? Um, I think in so far as, I mean, by the way, these um, um, institutions, uh, I mean, we call them integrity institutions. Mm -hmm. As far as those institutions are concerned, uh, whether it's the Anti-Corruption Commission, whether it's the um, um, Audit Service, or whether it's the... Um, what's the other one? The other integrity institution, the Audit Service, and... Electoral Commission. Yes, electoral, the National yes. Electoral Commission. I, I think that, I mean, this is, this is drawn from my experience. And by the way, there's a troublesome provision in the Constitution. So, for example, um, I mean, most of these um, institutions, their processes in their um, respective legislations mm. that would say, oh, the president would appoint on the advice, for example, NEC, on the consultation and advice of mm -hmm. political parties. Mm -hmm. But there is a provision in the Constitution that says that whether the president acts on an advice cannot be inquired into by any court of law. So whether the president uh, acts on the advice or not? Cannot be inquired to, right. into. So it's, it's pretty much what we call clawback. You give some sort of safeguards to say, oh, the president would um, not wake up one morning, you know, and then feel like, oh, I want to appoint Madam Spencer Cooker to this institution. He would do so based on the advice. Well, I hope he does wake up and decide um, to appoint Yes, <laughs> we'll, we'll pray so. He would do so based on the advice or consultation of certain persons. But then if the constitution says whether he acts on those advice um, or consultation cannot be the subject of any inquiry right. at all, at all. So that substantially undermines um, the checks and balances that that we, we, we think that ought to be in the Constitution. Mm. So I believe, and, and, and I believe that um, in so far as these institutions are concerned, anti-corruption, audit service, electoral commission, mm. the appointment of the heads of these in institutions 
should only be ceremonial by the president. Mm. I think that we should have a process whereby they are vetted. For example, in um, I think in South Africa, um, South Africa somewhere, they have a process where political parties, and by the way, the SLPP government get commended to the CIC mm. that there should be some electoral process for the chief electoral commissioner. Right. Yes. So they get commended. Right. But at the, at the end of the day, that recommendation was not um, upheld. But the point I'm making is that all these institutions should have processes whereby they are appointed and those names of successful persons can be forwarded to the president and he can just ceremonially append his um, greening. Mm. Mm to those persons. Because mm -hmm. once you do that, I mean, we see often and again um, in some institutions where just the idea that this person was appointed by the president and you cannot inquire into the advice or otherwise whether it was um, 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 either to or otherwise, mm -hmm. you cannot um, inquire into that. There is that feeling, and it's a legitimate feeling, that that person would forever be at the, at the, at the, at the service of... Um, um, the, pre the, the, the president. But once you have a process where they undergo a certain transparent process, mm. they are vetted, approved, um, selected at the end of the process, and the p president does um, and perform his ceremonial function, mm. I, am, I am very sure and I'm very certain that that would enhance the independence and the integrity of these institutions. Mm. And I think we'll come down to tenure. Because the other argument would say, oh, once he appoints them, they are tenured. tenured right. No, we, we no longer have Mr. Tenure. Well, let's, yeah, let's, we'll let's, come we'll, to that. We'll, we will come to tenure. Yes. Because um, an interesting theme that runs throughout uh, these programs that we've done here um, at Law Review it, for our constitution in particular, is that it seems to give and then it seems to withhold a little bit. It gives something to, to you know, the girls and women and, and then it withholds a little bit. It gives something for our environment, but then it withholds something. It gives something, you know, to the citizens in terms of how they relate and the, the three arms of government, and then it, with, it withholds because it, there's always some out. Yeah. Or yeah. Uh, either there's an out or... Um, it's prevented from being justici justiciable, so yeah. you can't really, yeah. you know, yeah. take anybody yeah. up on it for yeah. some whatever reason. That seems to be a theme <laughs> yeah. for our constitution, yeah. and whether maybe that's some the, part of the reason why there's this continuing push from the Justice Cowan-led um, Constitutional Review Committee, the process, and even before that, to you know, let's tweak it, and we'll get to down the line why perhaps some of these tweaks haven't, <laughs> haven't taken place yet. Let's just talk about um, the, the, an observation made um, by Owen Kai Kombe uh, at the CRC uh, that Section 5.2 um, of the Constitution provided that sovereignty belongs <coughs> to the people from which government shall derive its powers, authority, and legitimacy. And that Section 40, which then provides for the supreme executive authority to um, the president is ambiguous, inconsistent with fundamental principles of state policy, and therefore should be expunged and replaced. This now seems to be a running view. Um, what's your view on that? I, I think I, I, I subscribe to those sentiments almost 100%. This is because um, if you say sovereignty belongs to the people of Leone. And if you get such powers to the, to the president, um, such as, um, you know, fountain of honor, symbol of national unity and sub, um, sovereignty, mm -hmm. those are inordinate powers. Mm -hmm. They are very excessive. And I think it it's, it's sort of elevates the, the, the principle of sovereignty belongs to the people. Mm. These powers, being symbol of national unity, mm. symbol of sovereignty, it sort of elevates the president above the people. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem right there. And you and I know what happened to just a phrase in um, Section 40 that was taken out of context and used to, um, to justify the removal of a uh, sitting vice president. And by the way, if you come down to 40, um, 41... 44A says that all constitutional matters um, concerning leg legislation is conferred 
on the presidency. Well, let, let's yes. look at this. It seems to be a very good place for us to take a, a break. Uh, this is Law Review with your host, Nikki Spencer Coker, and my guest tonight is Augustine Marat Esquire as we uh, talk about the Constitutional Review Committee, the 1991 Constitution, and the provision of supreme executive authority. This is Law Review on AYB Channel 33. I'm Nikki Spencer Coker. And we're talking about Supreme Executive Authority. Ilraj's Law Review brings you the hot topics as it relates to a constitution and uh, in relation to the Constitutional Review Committee process. My guest tonight, back again, Augustine Mara Esquire. <laughs> we mustn't forget that, right? Yes. Uh, no, we can we forget mustn't, it. Mustn't forget um, Sori Sengbe, my middle name. Oh, Sori Sengbe, yes. You, that's, the, that's the important name, yes, right? Yes, 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 obviously, always. Good soul as well as I call you. <laughs> well, let's talk about this. Um, just before the break, we were just getting into um, the, the direct provision itself in uh, the Constitution, the, 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 the phrase itself, Supreme Executive Authority, uh, what it means, um, how it's how it's been interpreted obviously by the supreme court which is obviously the final arbiter of interpretation of the constitution that case of course the sans sans case in sierra leone um, in which the phrase supreme executive authority uh which was was interpreted but there's a school of thought that says the supreme court merely said what the Constitution already says. What's the big deal at the end of the day? The, the, the Constitution says that, you know, Supreme Executive Authority is with, with the President. And the President has this and the President has that. And the Supreme Court case, and the, the, they simply said, and yes, that's what it says. What's the fuss? I, I think, um, I mean, I, I, mean I, I was um, very, a very vocal critic of that judgment. And by the way, I have enormous respect for the judges who came together and um, wrote that judgment. Mm. I have respect for each one of them. What I don't have respect for is that judgment. Um, I think it belongs to the very sad part of our history, constitutional history. Um, you know, one of the drafters of this constitution um, wrote a piece far back in 2015. Um, I think even before the judgment was delivered, um, right after the incident of the removal of the vice president, mm. and to say that um, because apparently the, the notice that came out, the president relied on um, um, 41 uh, and um, invoking his supreme executive authority to say that doesn't say anything, merely describes. Mm -hmm. um, it's prescriptive, mm -hmm. you know, uh, as if saying, oh, you are the you are the goddess of art. I mean, if, if that, if that um, description does not come with specific powers, um, it's merely descriptive, merely um, what they call, constitutional scholars call the incidence of office. Because you are the judge, we usually say that the, the, the law resides in your bosom. Does that phrase um, give you any powers? It doesn't, it just describes you mm. by virtue of your office. Right, and so what the what the Supreme Court did, and it was very skillful, to say that there are no provisions in the Constitution which gives um, the president the, the powers to relieve the vice president. They were very clear, mm -hmm. but once the vice president loses membership in his political um, um, party, it means there is a vacuum because he, he no longer qualifies to be vice president. Mm -hmm. Once there is a vacuum, the Supreme Court believes that the president can exercise his supreme executive authority to fill in that vacuum. Okay. Right? So what they did for the first time was to lift the phrase supreme executive authority from section 41 and breathe life into it. So it's no, long, no longer um, prescriptive and dis descriptive. Mm -hmm. It now carries the power for the president. Um, it carries the power for the president to perform certain acts, i.e. if there's vacancy in the office of the vice president, we, we leave the vice president. Mm -hmm. And what it does also is to reinforce the powers of the presidency. 
and you, you and I were talking about oh, um, appointment of um, certain processes, certain institution, pursuant to other legislations, mm -hmm. which, by the way, would be um, um, secondary to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So by virtue of the supreme executive powers of the presidency, which the Supreme Court, by that decision, has recognized, it means that now that the president can, if he appoints you into a tenured office, he can relieve you based on supreme executive authority. Because that authority is coming from the Constitution. And I see now why and you were talking about validation. tenure. Yes. I see yes. now why, you, before the break, you, you spoke yes. about the fact that, that now yes. uh, that you were, I guess you, you didn't quite go into it. So let's go Correct. into it now. Yeah. And when you talked about uh, the effect that it has on tenure. Correct. So let's talk about that a little bit more. I mean, um, I mean it's, it's no secret that, I mean, when the um, current regime came into power, a lot of folks who held tenured office were shown the exit door. Right, and and many cons constitutional scholars. I mean, while um, people held the view, the views that um, it was unconstitutional, but then constitutional scholars to say no. By the way, by this judgment, if you were to litigate these um, incidents, you would you would you would you fail. Would lose. Mm -hmm. You would fail mm -hmm. because then you would say the man is invoking supreme executive um, um, authority, and that authority comes from the constitution, mm -hmm. and those persons are appointed. And their tenures, most of most of them, their tenures are in secondary legislations. Mm -hmm. And once you give such enormous powers, because what they what the Supreme Court has not done is not they have not prescribed the limits. So it's open ended. Mm. It could mean anything. In the president's estimation, they have not they have not defined mm -hmm. what supreme the executive. Is. What mm -hmm. they have done is to say in this case. It is supreme executive authority. Mm. They have not described it. They have not defined it. They have not set a limit. Mm -hmm. So as far as we're concerned, constitutional scholars, if you were to litigate some of those incidents, you would, could, could um, easily fail. Mm. Because then the issue of supreme executive um, authority, which is or which has been recognized by the Supreme Court as being um, you know, part of the powers of the presidency, mm -hmm. would apply. And that's, uh, that makes um, tenure very very laughable and that's why i believe that um this is uh, the, this phrase um should 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 be um, repealed and i'm i'm aware that in the constitutional review um, draft um, yes report, in, in fact in 2016 it's, it's been transformed to chief executive that's I mean, just, the recommendation i mean just to give some some sort of title but the worry is once you put chief Executive, executive authority somebody mm -hmm. some some group of people in, in 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 10 20 years down the line will come together sit in the supreme court and say well chief executive means that um if you are in, ten, in tenured office and the president um it pleases the president to relieve you is acting as chief executive and that's and that's synonymous with the ceos of companies mm -hmm. so i think that we should avoid titles the word president and the title president is enough. enough. Mm -hmm. It's enough. We don't need any um, um, surplusages. Well, interesting yes. because uh, as you talk about, you know, this, what, what, even what the dangers of, possible dangers of chief executive authority could be, and, and you talked about the fact that the CRC has now, uh, the recommendation from 2016 was the change of the name from supreme executive authority to the chief executive. Um, and that the powers of appointments should be limited to appointing ambassadors, envoys, judges of the Superior Court of Judicature, ministers of government, um, uh, I think public officials, subject to the provisions of the Constitution and parliamentary approval. Would, uh, you, you're, you're saying, I, you started saying that already, that it still would not be enough for, if you limited, even if you, you changed the name and you were specific as to what those powers of appointment, etc., what it was limited to. Would that not be enough? Because, because that's pretty much what we have. We have specific powers mm -hmm. given to the president for appointments, etc., etc. But once you give title, somebody would use title as, 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 as a form of power. So, and, and, and what constitutional history does is to guide you. Mm -hmm. Once you've made that mistake nationally, you stay clear of you know, any um, 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 circumstance that would repeat those mistakes. So, to be fair, yes. I mean, the statement, once you make the mistake, that's, that's, a, that's a, a, a question of opinion. Because there's, there's one side that says, yes, 
it was, you know, a colossal, colossal, you know, mistake. And on the other side, they said, no, it's perfectly within reason and, and it's fine. So that's the sort of dance that you do in a democracy um, and, you know, with citizens and, and with the arms of, of government. Again, at the position where you, ha you have a constitutional review and recommendations are put forward, this uh, recommendation um, has, was put forward in, from 2016 along with a host of others. And there's a school of thought that the reason why um, the, the recommendations were not accepted by uh, the, the former president was because of, this, uh, because of the limit on presidential powers. Uh, so what would be your take on that? I, I think, um, you know, I've, I've gone through the draft. I, I don't think the, the powers were substantially curtailed. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, I mean, some of those used to the enormous powers under the 1991 Constitution will, will be scared. Um, but I think it, 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 there were just few powers that were pulled off. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the issue of appointment of judges should not be within the limits of the presidency at all. Mm -hmm. The judiciary should be, uh, we say it's the arbiter, mm -hmm. I mean, usually between the executive and um, the governed. I don't think that appointment, I mean, the president can appoint his um, envoys to other states, can appoint his ministers, can sack them, mm -hmm. midnight, I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, he, he is a chief, he's in charge of the executive branch mm -hmm. of government. Mm -hmm. But once it comes to those persons, those other branches of government who um, um, we know they should be um, um, co-equal, mm -hmm. right? Those persons should, be appoint should not be appointed by, 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 by the president, but should be appointed as part of a process mm -hmm. um, that, um, I mean, could be made up, made up of um, folks who had gone from all sections of society mm -hmm. as the Judicial Legal Service Commission that we have. Mm -hmm. It's gone from Chamber of Commerce, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So once you have all those people who sit and then they um, interview folks who want to be judges, they, um, 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 at the end of the day, select them based on, on, on the process mm -hmm. and forward names to the president. That, I think, would ensure the independence of the judiciary. Because the problem is, if you were to, if you were to leave the power of appointment to the president, we know usually the parliament is a rubber stamp process. Uh, you, you know, subject to the approval of parliament, etc. That's a rubber stamp process. I, I know of only one incident in which a parliament of Selium, and I stand to be corrected on this, has rejected a nominee of a president. I think it was on that um, president, um, Tijan Kaba. Well, I think yes. that the, uh, our parliament will definitely have issues with you for if you say that they're rubber stamp yeah. <laughs> parliament. Uh, well, we live in a democracy, so and I should, they're, they're, I should, they're should be free to You're an totally opinion. free yes. to yeah. express your opinion, yeah. Yeah. and that's perfectly fine. So, uh, but I, I'm going to take you back a, a little bit because it sounds to me like you're saying that um, the, even the recommendations in the CRC don't go far enough. It, in terms of the curtail they, they on they on they uh, on the, the on presidential powers, they don't. So we uh, so would you for, for example um, we we know that there should be now an ongoing constitutional review um, committee of some sort to look at some of these and to and to then to bring some others forward. Um, we're hoping that the process you know becomes a little bit more open so that it, um, members of the public know who they are and can again okay. make input into. Um, into recommendations. Let me just ask you this. Would you support uh, a completely new constitutional review process? Um, I think we've spent um, nearly, it's more than a decade, I think it was 27, 2007, mm -hmm. that the first constitutional review process uh, was begun. Mm -hmm. 20, 2007, 2017, it's 10 years. Um, so we're almost clock in almost 15 years in mm. constitutional review process. We have not achieved anything. I think a, s a substantial work was done in the um, Edmund Cowan-led constitutional mm -hmm. review process. And I think um, there's a technical committee that's been set up mm -hmm. right now. And I know that few um, governance um, um, NGOs are putting together some position papers to ensure that they inform this committee mm -hmm. in so far some draft um, recommendations are concerned. Mm. So I think that we, we should not um, go back to square one. Mm -hmm. I think we can build on this process. What, what we don't know as um, 
governance activist is the composition of that technical committee. Correct. I've spoken to people for, for nearly, um, for the past three, four months, they can't say. I mean, they mention one name. Mm. I mean, that one person cannot constitute a committee that will be in charge of the soul of this country. Mm. But I mean, it's so shrouded in secrecy, nobody knows it's said in hush tones. <laughs> you know, I mean, this, for goodness sake, this is a constitution. I mean, it, there should be totally transparent mm. process mm. about it. Mm. I mean, the people came together um, in 2016 under um, Justice Cowan, mm. and they put together their rec recommendations. You cannot now um, undermine the will of the people by subjecting all those recommendations mm. to a technical committee unknown to the people of Selu. Mm. That's, 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 that's a valid, that is a valid yeah. point. And uh, we continue to, we, we, we raise the, the, the issue here uh, on law review and uh, we continue. I think I uh, have, you, have fact, you got any response? Well, I mean, I, in fact, I believe that I had one of the committee members here um, for uh, Mr. Uh, our colleague, Mr. Floyd Davis, um, on the program as we talked about um, issues Des to do with Des the, the decentralization. Yes, and also um, uh, specifically about decentralization, and, and he seemed he was involved in the process. So. Uh, I mean, you know, the word the word gets out. I do believe, and um, hopefully, as more Sierra continue to, you know, say that we want to be involved, we want to know, we want to ensure that our, you know, our, our opinions, our feelings, our our desires are enshrined in whatever comes next. And so we all just do the work yeah. of good yeah. of good yeah. citizens. Let me just um, bring you to another aspect um, of presidential powers that. Um, Come, came for us in Sierra Leone came into in more modern times stark relief because of our two pandemics or our two our epidemic and then our experience now the current pandemic Ebola and then um, COVID and state of emergencies or, or, or declarations of states of emergencies uh, in Ghana on, on, on in Ghana. Um, the President may, acting in accordance with the advice of the Council of State, by proclamation published in the, the Gazette, declare that a state of emergency exists in Ghana or any part of Ghana. Under our 1991 Constitution, the President can declare a state of emergency whenever, in his or her opinion, a state of public emergency is eminent or has commenced in situations provided for in our Section 29, um, Subsection 2. And during that after that declaration and during that period, he has um, extraordinary uh, powers during that state of public emer emergency. Basically, all law is suspended and abrogated only in, in, in effect to to the executive. Um, he may make, she may make regulations, take measures uh, that appear to her as necessary for maintaining and securing peace. And we've seen the demonstration of the how this uh, appears in. In recent modern times, because obviously there have been other state of emergencies in, in Sierra Leone, but let's just take the, um, the modern times for our young viewers today. Um, COVID, recently or currently now, and then Ebola, which was the 2014-2016 uh, the period. Your views on those powers? Yeah, I think the 2014, I, I think I was one of a um, few Sierra Leoneans, so... I did an open letter to President Koma back then calling mm. for um, state of emergency because of the aging um, Ebola, Ebola epidemic mm. by, by then. Um, and I'm sure that, um, you know, um, eventually got a, the, the president declared um, state of emergency for Ebola epi epidemic. Um, similar calls were made for um, state of emergency for um, coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Um, and by the constitution, the president may, in his opinion, um, I mean, that's, I mean, we've seen often and again, once you have such provision that gives um, such powers to the president to declare um, if, in his opinion, he leaves a lot of room for abuse. Um, so while I'm not saying that in these two situations, um, that power was abused. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that going forward, we should stay clear of giving powers to persons and just um, leaving those powers to their own estimation. 
In other countries, what they did was to state a number of circumstances. So once the situation fits one of the circumstances, it can be invoked. So they describe the place parameters on that powers. So you would not, um, you know, wake up one morning, want of a better phrase, and say we should declare. Um, and and there are certain safeguards, by the way, which mm. which I think. Um, was an ex excellent drafting, but I mean, obviously, constitutional scholars we we um, we um, 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 we advanced in terms of how those. So, for example, mm -hmm. within sev seven days, once it declares a state of emergency, Parliament must um, ratify mm -hmm. that proclamation. Mm -hmm. Parliament does not ratify that pro proclamation; it ceases to have effect. And I think that's a brilliant provision. Because, um, but many things could happen in, in seven days, right? But even before the seven days, I mean, uh, if we're being fair, you, were, you said, and I know you were just throwing the statement out there, you know, for the executive just wake up one morning and, and decide to declare. There's still certain circumstances that need to uh, uh, present themselves in mm -hmm. some form before that, you know, thought or that process could be a possibility. So it's not just, a, you know, I'm lying in bed one day and I wake up and then I decide. It's, there's still, there are some prerequisites mm -hmm. and then some checks after the fact. Mm -hmm. Do you really think that that's not, as it is, not enough? Uh, it doesn't because if it were enough, the drafters would not have um, included that um, seven-day um, period to say if, if, if it doesn't get rat ratified, mm -hmm. then it becomes um, um, null and void um, because... I mean, once you insert the words in his opinion, mm -hmm. meaning even if you say there's an act of war, there's an outbreak of disease, there's X, Y, and Z, once you say that, he would have to be the um, determiner, want of a better word, mm -hmm. you know, to say there's an outbreak there. It's not the scientist who would say that, because in his opinion. But I right? think you rightly yes. said, that you rightly said, and even if it is within uh, her opinion, there's still a process that says, okay, fine, you can go ahead and do that, but at some point, a certain period of time after that, this has to be put to the smell test, that to put, you know, to, to, you know, to, to be you know, just local about it. Yeah, you have to see so whether or not, Parliament would have to say, Does this act, is this actually something that we're going to ratify or are we going to kick this seven out? Seven days is such a long time. There True. Could be, <laughs> there could be irreparable damage caused in seven days. Mm. Uh, and, and I think that um, if you remove the words in his opinion, mm. if you clearly lay down those parameters, to link set to out, the declaration, yes. To the dec declaration, um, subject to, I mean, I mean, we, we, we were aware in mm. some other countries, 72 hours. Yes. Because nobody wants to um, 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 allow any chaos in society. Yeah. 72 hours before parliament, parliament would have to adopt that proclama uh, pro proclamation, mm. right? And I think also, uh, you know, um, um, so once you, once you, you move beyond the first order of having parliament ratify, you would then you are then required to submit whatever measures, regulations, mm -hmm. or whatever for the emergency for parliament to adopt the, those measures. Right. Right. My argument that I, you know, um, um, for canvas all, all around, I mean, since the uh, proclamation of state of emergency last year, mm -hmm. you know, I've said that within the 70s, the presidency can introduce measures. Once parliament adopts that proclamation, mm -hmm. every measure or regulation should not be placed before parliament. Mm -hmm. Sadly, in this case, in the case of coronavirus, we, um, the experience was that um, all those reg regulations that were introduced to the public, um, in my opinion, and, and I've litigated that in the Supreme Court, sadly, since last year, April, when I filed papers to say that all those regulations should be placed before parliament, for parliamentary approval, um, that's, that matter has not been listed for hearing. Mm. But essentially, my point is those regulations that were put um, into implementation by governments, by government officials, were unlawful and invalid. And that is the reason why we have 
law review to allow Sorry. opinions, no. um, especially when it has to do with um, the, the most important document that uh, we have uh, that governs us all, which is our, our constitution. So I, I suppose this is, this is more like sort of like a wrap-up question. Um, we've had longish history since independence in, in 60 years old. We're kind of a, you know, considered what? Uh, uh, senior citizens yes. uh, uh, of a country. Uh, we've had we've had our ups and our downs. We've had uh, democracy periods and out of democracy periods. Uh, would you say that our our presidents are in general um, um, upholders of the principle of separation of the doctrine of separation of power and respecters of, of the rule of law? Would you would you in general give them a just a, a great, um, not, no specifics, just in a general grade? If you look at the the full trend of, of our, those who we've elected. Uh, to head us. I, I don't think I'm old enough to um, <laughs> have an opinion on, on all the presidency. I think I was pretty young um, in um, 1991 and lived through the uh, military regime. Mm. But I, I'm very sure that we had some echoes of constitutional decorum mm. in 1996 mm. um, up until 2002. I know there were several, you know, few issues here and there, mm. but generally, we had a semblance of constitutional stability. Mm. I mean, we were just fresh from from brutal civil war. Mm. I mean, one would have expected that we we, we should we, we should have had um, a constitutional chaos, mm. but somehow the um, govern government then had a way to to have kept us together constitutionally, mm. and um, but sadly post. Post 2007, I think that's 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 when we started to have constitutional decline, and from 2007 to now, we were just um, perfecting the art of disparaging the constitution of Sierra Leone. We have shown no respect to the governing documents. This should define a nation, should define the arts, soul, spirits, and everything in between of a nation. What we have seen is consistent pattern of ma manipulation and open disregard for the textual provisions of this constitution. And there's no country on that that would go, that would develop if they don't attach significance and respect to the constitution. And, and I think that because the powers of um, the presidency, um, other branches of government are derived from this constitution, there should be um, utter respect for the constitution. The constitution says that you should not do X, you should not do Y. We should have public officials who respect the speed, the letter, and the intent of the constitution. So yes, I, I think you. that's my Thank basic you, assessment Mr. of the Mr. Sorry Sengbe Augustine Mara. And I'll leave you with the final and interesting fact that even as you say that, we're still wanting to make amendments to the Constitution. Quite. <laughs> so, yes. Because it's a living document. It's a, it is it's a, a living, living document. It's a living document. Right. If you um, listeners out there uh, would like to, um, you know, express an opinion on anything we've said tonight, you can go to the Ilraj uh, page uh, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, and leave a message in the comment section there. Through the 1991 Constitution, uh, though it caters to the doctrine of separation of powers, we've witnessed a steady and continued, as we said, growth in the executive power in Sierra Leone over the last 30 years, which can be seen under successive governments, with notable instances of executive abuse of power. To ensure the proper function of the principle of separation of powers and real checks, and balances for our democracy. At ILRAJ, we continue to call for the 1991 Constitution to be amended in accordance with the Justice Cowan recommendations. Mm. It's been a pleasure having you on Law Review, Mr. Morat. It's a pleasure to be back. <laughs> Good soul, as I call I you know. again, yeah. Thank you to our producers at AYV, Amadou Lamranaba, and Sheku Mohamed Sila, and the technical team. Till next time, I'm your host, Nikki Spencer Coker. Good night. Yes, subscribe. You always the watch we program them, but you not subscribe yet to the channel. All wait till you get for do, press this red subscribe button, and then you come over here and press this bell. So the bell option, 
Press this one with all. A rondom. A nugget for cost you anything. When you do this, now sign for show say you the support we for make we do more. Thank you for your help me for share this program. Yeah! God bless you.